jump the chomp. Here we go. And our first one was an email that you got, Fred. Seriously. And Bruce just had to drop out to go answer a phone call. So, Bruce, you are our first jump the chump. We'll come back to that. If you can, go ahead and let us know when you're back. I'll put that in the note here back to him. Okay, we'll get back to Bruce's question here. Mike from DNS. We have customized classic MES forms are currently using for Shopfler data connection, would like to move to browser based. Um, have others had success uplifting classic customizations kinetic? Is there a light MES in kinetic? Um, seen reference to it, but can't seem to find it. Um, I haven't had any problem modifying kinetic MES. Um, it's still done with the application studio. So I would just, whoop, let me head back there. I would still run the conversion 180 to upgrade if your customization is simple and not too complex. It should upgrade to kinetic, otherwise you just have to rebuild it in application studio. Mike, you're unmuted if you want to join in here. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Um, I guess I was kind of also just wondering in general what uh, other companies are using if they're if they're sticking with um, kinetic MES or if they found something that uh, works just as well that uh, is is uh, Epicor friendly or if I should just go ahead and and migrate all the all the custom uh, MES forms over to kinetic. Just kind of wondering which path to go down. And uh, Hannah, Hannah uh, Jose suggested you might have some input here too. I've got you unmuted if you've got some information. I don't know why I keep saying that. I really don't. Um, <laughs> uplifting. So far, um, as far as a light screen, I don't really know about that. I haven't heard of anything anyways. I think it, uh, Kevin Burrow mentioned that it's kinetic data collection. Data collection is the same thing, I believe, as MES. Yeah. So they had two screens for a while. I don't know if they have gotten rid of the other one. They had a data two collection. And they, so no, no, no. They have one in, well, yeah. I think um, when kinetic so first I'm, came out, they did a light MES, but I thought that went away with the, when they right. got it. Okay. Fixed yeah. So up, originally so they speak. had um, data collection called DC and mode MES, and it's all been merged into data collection now. That's there's only one at this point. Okay. Yeah, I think I must have come across that earlier reference to a light. I know I saw it in print, but uh, couldn't find it. I think that got it. I think that gets it. You did did that to all folks. <laughs> awesome. Next one was uh, Kathy over at Ace Precision. Um, brief background on creating part numbers for mixed tubes of braised paste when they uh, release the job mix raised paste ahead of when they actually need them. They have to run the braised sample through the furnace to verify the braised paste mix flows properly. The Epicor question is they said a certain operation is a fixed quantity and method. For example, a job to release mixed 25 tubes of braised paste. So the first stop would be a quantity of 25. The second op, which is the op where they put the sample through the furnace, would mean to be mixed quantity of one piece, no matter what the quantity is for the first stop. Is something like that currently available? And Kathy, I've got you unmuted. Wouldn't that be like a first run or first run or first article? I don't think they wanted to do it that way because it's this is just what uh, the user had given me and they had asked other of our super users and I don't think they wanted to go with like a first first run through that they wanted it as a fixed 
excuse me, fixed quantity of 25 and then the next operation being a fixed quantity of one. And then they would put that 24 back into stock to pull out. But I can ask them if they want to go that route. Well, you could do, I mean, if the one isn't going to be put in stock. It is not because it will be used. I was wondering if maybe you could just set a like a standard of scrapping one on that operation. So you'd run 25, but you know you're only going to get 24 out. So put it through as 25 and then scrap the one and then put the 24 into stock is what you're saying? That's what I'm thinking, but I'm not a, a great person with inventory and stuff. If one of the other people on the call can chime in that might know more than me. So you are producing 25? We are producing 25. Then we have to test it to make sure it works. And then we'll put the 24 in stock. I mean, that sounds like first article inspection. I don't know. I mean, that is, I guess, <laughs> first article inspection. That is first article because um, you throw the first one away, yeah. Right. That That is exactly first article inspection, and there is a setup for that. I know you said you didn't want to go that route. That is the native way to do it. Uh, the other option is you could, if you're getting rid of one, you could you could uh, DMR one of the, uh, or scrap one of the outputs. Um, but that would not, I don't know what that would do for your cost. What do you, yeah, what do you want the cost to do? Yeah, what do you want the cost to do? Because if you scrap it, that's just going to go. Yeah, and I did not ask on costing. Because if you just report one as scrap, not non-conformant, if you just report it as scrap, you know, if you reduce the job to 25 to 24 before you put it to stock, the 24 that you put to stock will carry the cost of all 25. If you average cost it anyway. Yeah, and, and we do average cost. Or no, we do standard, excuse me. Oh, if you're standard, then it it will come out at standard. So you, you, yeah, it would still work from a costing perspective as long as okay. the cost of 25 is set up. The cost of 24 is set up to bear the cost of 25. Okay. All right, I will go back to uh, my engineer and give him these options and see what which way he wants to test it out. Thank you. I mean, the one thing I would say is if you do first article, then and it fails, you can then DMR the the raw material that you issued and 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 process that through properly, which which might be what you want to do in the end, assuming there's a pro a issue with your raw material and that's why the uh, inspection failed. Okay. So go the first article, and then if it does fail, then DMR it to adjust it correctly. Okay. Even in the operation, you could also do a quantity per parent and a fixed quantity for scrap. So you could just turn around and say one's going to be scrap. But that could affect their co costing is what Lori was saying. If the one piece fails, do all 25 fail? Yeah, if the one does fail, then all 25 will fail. Yeah, but if the one yeah. passes, then the 24 would go into stock to be used on other jobs. Okay. Yeah, if they all 25 are going to fail, I would definitely recommend first article and then process through the MR to return your materials and everything else. That's the, okay. that's the clean way to do it. It's a little more, you know, a few more clicks, but it is the proper way to do that if you're going to fail the entire batch afterwards. Yeah, if it, the first one fails, they all fail for sure. Yeah, because okay. if you just do the scrap, then what's going to happen is you scrap one, fine, but then you're still going to have to end up either receiving that job to inventory or scrapping the rest of the job, right? And that doesn't, like, if you go through the first article inspection, that, that kind of flows nicely that way. Okay, thank you. That would work. Another would be just to non-conform the 25 from inventory before, when the job is started and put 24 back to stock and one to the garbage because I'm going to say the 25th piece is not usable, but the 24 are verified as good and they can then get issued to the job. Could just do an inventory nonconformance as well. 
So have it at 25 and then do an inventory non-conform, put the one through. For 25 pieces, when you do the test, let the one get scrapped and the other 24 go back to the shelf as good if they pass the inspection. Okay. I think this will give us a few options to test out to see what's going to work best for them. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, and by the way, Kathy, you're the first person I had to adjust the font size to get all of your words in there. <laughs> I copied it from his email, so I didn't misrepresent. Awesome. Um, next one we have is Graham. Let me see. I'm trying to click here. Um, can a function be added as a menu option? Uh, you can schedule a function using the the, process, exactly. the the function schedule process, but I don't think you can add. How would adding a function as a menu? Yeah, because function needs to do something. There really wouldn't be a menu option. Are you finding Graham, Fred? I didn't see him on the list. We may need to come back to Graham here because the other one is also can a function call be uh, run from PowerShell? A function hmm. in theory, yes, I haven't tried it, but because you could call the shell command, you could run anything. Yeah, the shell command would turn around run Epicor. You could run a data change. When that occurs, the function kicks off. So you could have you could have a function that you know moves a file, for example, via PowerShell. In theory, I haven't tried it, but I don't see why you couldn't do it. I mean, because we have people that use PowerShell to load DMT in an automated fashion with orders, and just putting a data directive on that table that you're modifying with the DMT would turn around and kick off your function indirectly. Graham, if you pop back in, we'll, I'll go ahead and head back to slide six here. Um, Tony, um, in sales order, we can part with multiple kit components. We initially set it to ship from California in the release. A week later, we want to change it to ship from Texas. Only the parent changes. The components do not. We get the error message, row's been modified by another user and couldn't. Jose, you guys are multi-site. Are you hitting this with, are you guys using kits? Uh, we use kits very sparingly. Um, I have not come across this problem. Well, Jose's uh, power went out too. Ah, awesome. But this I haven't heard of where the kits don't get updated with the parent. I would almost question, Tony, also, do you have a method or data directive already on this that's putting your record in a uh, dirty state and not able to save, or it's saying that, hey, it's been modified by another user. That I've seen many times where people have a directive that turns around and fires, but doesn't refresh the data that's on the screen. So when they try to do something else, it says the row has been modified by another user. Am I muted or unmuted? You're good. What? We can hear oh, you. Come on. Oh. You have to say, okay. what when they do this? Stop telling them we can hear them. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, um, so the one thing is, is that yes, we are customized, and yes, very much so. But if you do the update from the back end. Would it not also then try to run those, or would it not because that's only front end related? Yeah, but you've got BPM running. That's that's running in the back end too. BPM's yeah. running on the server. They don't run client side unless you're running this in classic and an older version. It's classic. It's 10.2.700.3. And I thought that it might be a customization on the form that's causing the error. So that's why I asked if you would update the back end just by using a, um, an update statement, which I know that, you know, that's not recommended, but I'm trying to obviously debug this error message. So if you did that though, 
then you those BPMs or data changes wouldn't fire, correct? Yeah, but Tony, you can still run the update on the OTRANS object. You just need to do a refresh on some of them if you're not running the master update so that the screen is running the latest and greatest version. So you can still have code on your screen that turns around and updates the record, but you do need to turn around and run the, the update or do a refresh on there. I believe there was a transaction scope to refresh. So we, my brain cells here. Yeah, yeah, no, I looked up a lot of um, stuff on the Epi users and I did, you know, Google this and I did put a case into Epicor and a lot of the comeback was, is that you just have to hit the refresh icon and then try it again, which we definitely did multiple times and, you know, with still no luck. So that's why I was curious to, you know, what, what would be the steps in, in that process? From my viewpoint, it sounds like you definitely have a BPM interfering with something. It's trying to set something else or is setting something else. Um, you could turn off all BPMs on your test server and then try it and see if that works. If it does, then you know you have a BPM that's interfering and then you can narrow it down from there. All right, and that would trigger this type of a message. Row has been modified by another user? BPMs do that, yeah. So if you have a data directive that's updating a field um, and then commits it, your screen's not committed yet. So it, it gets confused and presents that error. All right. That sounds like the most likely. I guess I could also use the base, um, the base version of the screen as well to try this, right? Correct. Right. If 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 it's a UI um, customization that's interfering, running it in base would solve that. If it's a BPM, running it in base will do nothing. Right, and that may have been what Calvin was saying before. I'm not too sure. <laughs> yep. Um, All right. The other thing. There is, if it is a BPM or a data directive, there was a command put out of the Yahoo group about refreshing the transaction in link. Oh gosh. Yeah, it's on it's on Epi users. Uh, okay. I, I'll find it, but but if the BPM is causing it, that will do it. Um, I would definitely try the. Uh, the you know running the customization on base and see if it happens and then also like hannah said turn off your bpms and run it so run it on a pristine system with no bpms and no customization if it doesn't happen you know it's either one of those two options and then you can troubleshoot from there all right well thank you very much that's an approach thank you awesome our next one i'm trying to get there it's from mark honey um, online today, wondered if there have been any reports, good, bad, or otherwise, of running Windows 2022 with Kinetic under Proxmox Hypervisor. Anybody running first the Proxmox Hypervisor? Before we start worrying about the Windows OS, anybody running the Proxmox Hypervisor? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> uh, Kevin Feldman. Feldman says he's got a home server running it. And Kevin, I've unmuted you. So uh, yeah, my home server has Proxmox and I, I run server 2019 with no issue. Uh, I've certainly never tried uh, Epicor or Kinetic on that though. So I can only give you that Windows server 2019 runs great. <laughs> Chad, Windows 22? Uh, Maybe I need to upgrade. I'll report back. And Chad uh, Blanchard says he's he's tried it, but not in production anywhere. I mean, me personally, I haven't had any experience with Prosmark uh, hypervisor specifically, but uh, virtualization seems to be keen down to like the same type of principles across the board of the spectrum. So. As long as you throw the appropriate resources that Kinetic requires to run, it should run smoothly. And let me go back up to our first slide. Bruce came back here. And Bruce, I think I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and uh, I already have. You give us, oh. You're good. You out there, Bruce? Go ahead and unmute yourself, Bruce. Oh, somehow he got muted by the organizer again. There you go, Bruce. Oh. 
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm back. Um, I just, uh, ironically, we just left the uh, Kinetic meeting. We're looking to move over to the cloud here pretty soon. But uh, this is, this question has really nothing to do with that. It's just, um, uh, just basic blocking and tackling stuff with uh, finance. Um, <clears throat> currently, we run all of our burden costs for our company through um, our resource groups. You know, most of the stuff, you know, traditionally, uh, most of our stuff is manufactured. And uh, recently, we've been running into some issues with our costing that we want to uh, reallocate our burden so that we're doing more with uh, allocating more onto our purchase parts as well um you know given our mix of manufactured versus purchased so i was just curious uh you know it's a pretty involved conversation but i'd be interested in any anybody that's using epicor um that would be able to talk to me uh you know to discuss how they're uh, allocating cost to purchase parts whether they're doing you know full abc costing or um anything like that and you looked at the material burdens it's adding a material burden. Are you talking about like freight in and the cost of warehousing and? Yeah, yeah, apply, be, yeah. We would apply it to the uh, freight in. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. We would apply it to the uh, material burden uh, for those types of costs. We do it on a limited basis because we got a huge uh, freight in cost from our overseas suppliers. Uh, so we do it for them. But beyond that, we don't. Uh, allocate any of our overhead you know for instance we have a, a purchasing team you know and their costs don't really touch uh manufacturing costs uh, so allocate their costs for those would make more sense i mean because that's the other place you can add a, a fixed rate to the, the the cost of purchasing parts that is above and beyond what the supplier is charging you and you can use that for you know what, whatever it can be a flat rate across all parts but each part can carry its own material burden percentage so for those parts that are coming from overseas you can allocate a different percentage to that so that's the only way I know outside of the resource groups to get burden into the system. Okay, uh, is that uh, done at the point of receipt? It's applied whenever that part moves through the system. So, uh, you know, there's an 8% material burden on what, uh, whatever part number that that burden is on. So when you do the receipt, yes, it comes in and, and hits the purchase cost. And that's what's going to go to the R&I to pay your supplier. And then the material and then the uh, material burden would go to a different account based on how you got your um, cost cost set up, cost accounts set up in the um, GL controls. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, because I, I was in there the other day and I and I, I did notice uh, that there was some, some availability in the, um, uh, some functionality I should say, within the receipts. Yeah, I'll take a look, a deeper look into that. Um, yeah, you can see, I mean, exactly how it flows, especially if, you're, if you go into a test, test environment and just run one through on a part number that you add a material burden percentage to, and then you can see what the flow is through the system. Okay. Let me go ahead and get back to slide nine here. And Kevin Burrow has a question from today. Is it possible to use Application Studio to create new screens not based on layers of existing screens? Uh, yeah, I believe you can use a new app screen for that, right? Yeah, you can use new, the new app screen, but it's based off of like data from dashboards and stuff. Um, if you want to get really crazy and I really don't advise this, but you can go into your server and copy the JSON files from a different application, wipe it all out and then add your own information. And it basically does what the SDK does. Um, but I think for normal people, um, you just go into the app development screen and go from there. And if you have the SDK, obviously that gives you a built-in menu for that. Would you still be able to add a UD? 
entry to form to the menu and then go and put an application layer on top of that UD? Yeah, you can still do that. Yeah, that's the same as always. That should that should be no different, I don't think. So Kevin, that might that. also work for you. The nice thing about that these days is they don't show you all the keys anymore, so you don't have to hide keys two through five. It's just key one in description now. Oh, come on, the negative need... coordinates always worked. <laughs> in 2020, uh, 23 point something, they added the create new app wizard. Um, and you don't need the SDK for that, but it is based off of, um, usually based off of another screen or, or at least a dashboard. But there is the create new app wizard where you just go through and, and enter basically an application name. You tell it how many pages your app has and it will create a new application for you. And honestly, um, once you get that shell of an application, you can go into App Studio and add literally whatever you want. You can use REST to call any data source and pull it into a grid and do your thing. Um, so you just need that starting point from the app wizard. The app wizard usually wants you to uh, start with a BAQ. So you, you write a BAQ, you go to app wizard, you select that BAQ as your starting point, and it'll basically give you a basic landing homepage. And then from then on, you can just app studio your way into a brand new app. And you don't require the SDK for that. Kevin, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. Awesome, just wanted to make sure before we move on, I'm like, there were a couple ideas of how to do that now, which one worked best for you? That, 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 that is very helpful, thank you all. Awesome. Our next one came in from Kyle here, and how to do one-to-many receipt entry to AP invoice entry. I'm gonna go hunt for Kyle, because I'm a little confused by the question. I think uh, it sounds like it was a little. <laughs> well, I, I think because you, you can take a single receipt and divide it amongst multiple invoices, I think that might be what he's talking about. So you can partial it. It says that you've got yourself muted there, Kyle. All okay. right, now can you hear me? Awesome. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so I'm referring to when you have a PO receipt and the PO has, say, uh, one line for two units and the receiver will um, not receive them in first because you got invoice first. So you would put the invoice in for one line for two units. And then when the receiver receives them in, you're going to have potentially two lines of one unit. And when you do the matching of the invoice and the receipt, it does not let you do one invoice line to two receipt lines. So you're doing a logged invoice before it's received and then trying to do the matching to the logged invoice. Correct, because so we can balance to our um, parents who is overseas and we have say a six week lag time on receiving the goods, but we still need to match out. And it's much easier to do as an unreceived line versus as an advanced line, because then you still have to stick in the second invoice to clear it out. So it's preferred to do one um, and it doesn't allow you to do it. So I was curious if someone had a trick. So Lori, you're a county wizard here. Yeah, we don't use that, that function though. And I do know that they did add in 10 that you could finally take one receipt and split it amongst multiple invoices. And that was a, a, a really big break for us. But um, I don't know that they fixed the other side of it that says if you've already done a logged invoice that you're gonna be able to pull in uh, multiple receipts into that. Yeah. Have you just pull in the one? I mean, hopefully we're only talking two receivers, but could you just pull in the one and then GRNI the other? Um, I mean, if you show me how that works, is I really don't want to have um, manual plugs to the to receiving or the goods receipt, not invoice, 
or um, I know Epicor calls it a little bit different. Now, you would have to do a adjustment to the gross receipt, not invoice, and get rid of the receipt because you already shoved it through attached to the AP logged invoice with more quantity on the logged invoice than you had on the receipt. <clears throat> How does your clearing account get cleared out to zero? When you do the gross receipts, not invoice on the second packing slip that came in, that would take it out of the AP clearing. But you still have to stick in a second invoice? No. Or am I missing something? I believe in the invoice entry, there is a gross receipts on invoice, which gets rid of the receiver. Is that correct, Lori? When you're doing, when you do it, receipt first and then invoice. Uh, yes, you put in one, it breaks the receipt, says it's not done yet. And you can post that invoice and move on. And then you can pull that same receiver into a second invoice or third invoice or whatever you need. Um, I don't know how it works when you, when you invoice it first. Yeah, that's the problem. The invoice is going in first, the receiver is second, and neither person um, knows what the other one did. That's why we don't use it. It's, it it's, be never, it's, it's always been, unless it's perfect, it, it's, it's, always, it's been a problem. Right, yeah, which is why I posted out the kinetic ideas for the enhancement, but that has gone nowhere. Yeah, like, a lot of the ideas have been out there for a really long time. Yeah, I know. That's why, that's why it's like, well, what's the better avenue to get some of these fixed? Because then really that um, module that they have is not very useful. It's kind of a, a waste, in my opinion. And we have six week lag from our parents, so we do need a match. So we throw in advanced billings, but you still have to come around and do a second invoice to clear out the advance, a zero dollar invoice, which is also annoying. Yes, you do. Because yeah, there's no way around having to do a second invoice to clear that. It's it's you see it like if you do an advance for a hundred percent of the value of the PO, you yep. still have to do the, the zero dollar invoice to clear out that advance. And that's what we do, but it's really not the best way. And I know other systems have already solved this issue, and I'm surprised Epicor has not solved this issue. Well, it took them a really long time to get the front end the. The first part of it that I was talking about, where you can have one receipt and multiple invoices, it took them many versions before that came out. So I'm yeah, glad, that, too, but it was a long yeah. time. Yeah, I was, I'm actually surprised to hear that. So when we went on Epicor, that was not an issue because um, that's that's huge. I mean, like, it, I, yeah, it what? was. And so um, sometimes the receiving it, people get creative too, and then that causes. You know, it's like well, it's the same part on all three lines to just do one receipt. <laughs> like, not helping. Yeah, so I don't know. Maybe there's someone out there from Epicor that'll take this up as an issue and maybe fix it. You can always submit it to the ideas portal. I did over a year and a you half ago. Put it in ideas. I would say put it up on the Epi users and see if other people that are having AP logged invoice issues with multiple receivers, because they would be the ones to jump on the bandwagon with your ideas ticket. Yeah, I can try it that way to promote. You know, I have several ideas out there, and that's why I asked you before, because it's like you put them out there and they just, they don't go nowhere. That's right. Make sure that you also put it up on the Epi users for other people to see it. Because if they don't actively comb through the ideas portal, they're never going to find it. But a lot of people will read the Epi user help postings, notice it, and then can go to the ideas and add themselves onto it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that'd be good. There's several, I think, key fixes that could be done pretty quickly to get to modern times. Awesome. Uh, let me see, where's our next Tanner post online today? 
is it possible to change the site on the kinetic screen based on the data loaded? We have seven sites and many times users know the job number, but they do not know which site it's in and moving be between sites can be tedious. It's doable, a, but it's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say you could write a BAQ that's cross company and you could put in the job number and it would tell you the site. That way you don't have to go through all seven sites. You just, you could run that for many, any of your uh, sites and switch. So you can do a couple of things to help that. So you, in the kinetic, are you I'm assuming you're talking about the browser-based kinetic screens, right? So in the browser-based kinetic screens on the top right of your screen, you have that bar that gives you the, what site you're logged in and all that stuff. Um, you could put in the description of the site, put the number if, if that's an issue. And then that, that way, when they go to switch sites, they would see the number in the description. We have the same problem. We have 41 sites. Um, and now that you'd mention it, uh, and I think about it, I think I'm gonna go put the numbers on all our descriptions because I have the same exact problem. I'm like, I gotta go to switch plan 21. Which one is that? Um, so that might be a helpful uh, indication. You could try to switch sites using App Studio. Uh, the problem with that is that it would change your session. Uh, it would have to change, change your session site for it to work effectively, which means that any other screens you have currently open are going to also now be pointing to the wrong site. And I leave it to you in the exercise of figuring out what's gonna blow up there. Because if you try to save a job in the wrong screen on the wrong site, things are gonna go sideways, sideways rather quickly. And you could on the job traveler put your site on there too. Because where are they getting that job number from? Wherever they're pulling it from that you say they know the job number. If whatever piece has that, site information that's going to help them know what to what site to switch into as well. Um, Tim Shoemaker also pushed out a uh, user prefix for the site, which was kind of what Jose was saying is putting the code on the yep. end or the beginning. Does that help Tanner? I think I unmuted you if you want to chime in. I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, yeah, it doesn't help our situation tremendously because we have, we've got a kind of a unique business where we do a lot of field service and uh, we've got a central admin site that they know a job number for the service job, but they have to like click into the right site to get into the right site to open the form. And I had created a classic customization that basically it'll close the form on open and relaunch in the right site based on the job number that was entered. Um, and yeah, I'm talking about just how would I make it work on the kinetic web browser. Um, I'm kind of just scoping through my customizations to see what I need to do to get prepared for the move to Kinetic. And maybe it's just a matter of creating my own job entry screen. So one thing you can do when most Kinetic screens is you can pass in, if you're in the straight up in the URL, uh, you can pass in the site ID as a parameter on the URL when you open the screen. So what you could do is you could write a dashboard um, that has a way for them to search for jobs. And then in that dashboard result, you could return back basically an application link that would launch the application with the site URL. Um, you can kind of see how it works. If you go into Kinetic and add a favorite to any in any menu, it'll ask you if you want to make that favorite be current site always, or you want to pick a specific site. So for your testing purposes, pick a specific site on the dropdown and hit save and then click on that favorite item and you'll see what it does. What it does is it passes in the regular entry call, but then at the end of the URL, it passes ampersand your company ID and ampersand your site ID. And that switches the site for that particular screen launch. So you could use the same technique they're using to, to do that with a dashboard and a, and a button click. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. 
and if your jobs stay in the site they're created in, um, maybe you could do a BPM or something when the job number is created that knows the site and you can prefix the site onto the job number. That way it's very obvious which one you need to go into. Yeah, it's that they're trying to multi, they're basically trying to open these jobs for seven different sites at the same time, just going through them. And, and your, they don't want to Yeah, your dashboard's probably better. Yeah, the dashboard sounds like a good idea. Thank you for your input, guys. I appreciate it. Awesome. And our next one is Bob Giblin submitted here online. How can we in a BAQ get multiple items from the minimum record? Well, Bob, I'm going to have to go ahead and unmute you because that's not a minimum. Uh, for example, part trend is trying to retrieve lowest date on certain transactions for a part and quantity related to that date. Bob, you out there? Yeah, I'm out there. Um, so basically, we want to find the first time we either put it in stock with a purchase order, a transfer, or uh, you know, manufacturing. But besides the earliest date, I want to bring back the quantity. And the reason is that'll tell us whether it was a sample or an actual order. So what you so could do, Bob? For like a stock to MFG, and what was the date on it, and what was the quantity? Or what was the sold estate and quantity? But, but it's on like a, a dashboard of uh, like all of our parts so that you can get the earliest. Right. Yeah. So what you can do, Bob, is you'd have a um, query that if you're doing it by part number, um, you'd say like it's a, a stock to manufacturing type. So you put your where clause on that for your part trend group by part number, get your minimum date. Then from that subquery, you're going to do another query that uses that subquery joining to part tran on the part number and that date and that transaction type. And from there, you can get your quantity. So you have to find your minimum date first to find out what record you need out of part tran again. Won't that be kind of slow hitting part tran twice for the same? Part tran's going to be slow to start with. <laughs> hitting it <laughs> once well, I, is going to be that. slow. <laughs> you don't want to like um, double hit it. So but when you're hitting it the second time, you're going to be hitting it by the index. Um, I'm posting. Uh, I'm sending this to the to the organizers. Maybe maybe Kevin can reshare. I'm posting uh, a link to a post yep, that I Brandon Anderson put out there. Um, it's a it's a walkthrough to some advanced techniques on BAQs, and he covers something called a windowing function. Um, and a windowing function will let you do exactly what you want. That is to basically do a group by uh, or an aggregate function, and at the same time get additional information on that record uh, of that aggregate function. So um, he's got a video. It's about an hour and a half lecture that he did um, at Insights last year or this year actually. Um, and he went ahead and re-recorded it and posted it on the forum. So I would recommend you check that out. But windowing functions will let you do uh, that uh, as an option also. Okay, thanks. Yep. And I pulled it up on screen just in case. Also, I'll go ahead and put that in the minutes for you, Bob. I already put it into the chat uh, oh, question and answer, okay. so got it. And then now in the famous words of Fred, uh, th 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 that's all folks. Any other uh, questions we have for Stump the Jump? Sorry, Fred, you were the one with the speech impediment today, so I could have fun with it. All right, looking good. Awesome. You got the survey and stuff that you're gonna send out, Fred, to everybody? That goes out automatically, yes. Well, you can still um, get credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> So if you would answer the survey when it comes out, um, also tomorrow morning, I'll be sending out an email on behalf of Source Day. Um, they have, let me see if I can read this right. They have a Google form. If you fill out that form, uh, they'll give you a $10 gift card as well as make a $10 charitable donation on your behalf. Uh, so if you're interested in Source Day, you can actually 
uh, help out your community as well as help out yourself, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, so I'll send that out uh, tomorrow morning once I've got all the links in, in the proper place. And we did have another couple questions come in here, Kelvin. Oh. <clears throat> Kevin has said if he uh, creates a single query with all the data needed, that's also extremely helpful. And Kyle's asking, uh, what is the parent and child on fixed assets? I'm thoroughly confused by that, Kyle. Let's go ahead and unmute you. Am I unmuted now? There you go. Okay. I'm going to pull it up so I can actually speak to it very closely. So, um, yeah, on the asset entry screen, there's a tab called parent child. And you can uh, select a parent asset and associated children. What does that really do? what does that really mean in english like what is it doing in regards to depreciation or capitalization or is it really just the ability for you to say hey these 10 assets are closely associated together are you okay if you share your screen kyle um give or is me it... a little bit <laughs> i don't want to i don't want to put you on yeah. the spot and then find out we let some confidential information out yeah, um, yeah. Um, okay, I should be good. Where do I share my screen? Just a moment. I'll make you presenter, and then you should have a link that says "Show My Screen." There we go. We can see a blue background of your desktop. Oh, let me cover that up. There we go. There's your Epicor screen. Perfect. All right. So, asset maintenance, asset entry, whatever you really want to call it. Um, you have the asset parent child and then these fields. What does that mean in English? What is it doing? Can you hit help, application help? Does that give us any? I would think it would be like you're talking, like um, for lack of a better term, if you had an asset of a office and then child parts of that would be like the desk, the computer, the chair. Uh, but I was wondering if maybe in the help it might tell us exactly what they're thinking there as a parent child select a parent and remove a parent assets can have multiple child well that's kind of the obvious thing that we already knew huh yeah, yeah. and those are the only things that associate with it right so uh let me see if tim shoemaker is still on because i think i unmuted him yeah i I believe I'm not an expert at fixed assets, but I believe it has to do with more along the lines of you. You have a piece of equipment that is an asset, you know, a, a machine out in your machine shop, and then somebody decides to add on a child, like a uh, a new computer that's going to be, you know, controlling that asset. Uh, that's a child of the parent. Um, it's part of the parent, so therefore, if you move that parent, it goes along with it. So I think that's what it's used for, but I don't know what that, how that affects anything other than it, it probably isn't going to change the depreciation of the parent or of the child. It's probably more just about linking the, the two together. The two together. Like yeah. an organizational. Yeah. A grouping of assets. Kind of like customers, right? You have a parent and child customer, although if you don't do credit sharing right, it just allows you to know that they're part of a family, right? I think that's what it's used for, but I I again I'm not I'm not up on my fixed assets. Yeah, it, it's just sometimes you get those that are a little peculiar and you're just kind of like, well, in English, please, Epicora. Or Perfect. maybe so a few more. Think details. of your think of your building. And then think of the air conditioners on the roof of the building and the garage doors. The air conditioners and the garage doors are assets that are children of the building. Each is going to go through depreciation based on when the asset was attained. But the parent-child relationship is saying the building contains all of these children with it. If we get rid of the building, what do we do with any of the children that were in there as well? 
and just because you dispose of the building, it's not going to dispose the child. In Correct. Nature. But you need to go in and dispose the children before I think you can dispose the building. I don't know the answer to that. It may it may be for doing some of that automation too. So you'd have to. This would be a good place to go into your test account and put a child on a parent and then try disposing of the parent and see what happens. Yeah, I didn't notice anything happening any different than what was expected. But then again. Don't know every occurrence that's going on, and you're like, oh, well, what does it really mean? All right. I appreciate it. Awesome. Our next one is from uh, Caitlin Christensen. What's I'm the best sure track I'm not stop showing. That'll work. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we have what is the best practice for reconciling the receive not invoice to AP clearing and stock status to inventory. Um, hers are definitely out of whack and most likely from journal entries through time. Um, she's new to the role, I'm not sure where's the best way to start digging this out. Now, Caitlin doesn't have a mic, so we can't go ahead and ask her questions. Lori, do you have a best practice that you follow for clearing up the GRNI and the stock status? Um, we definitely run the um, make sure there's no journal entries in those because you're never you shouldn't be journal entry into a sub ledger account. Um, but for the RNI, the one thing you need to make sure is you really that you are rolling that start date back far enough that you are getting all the received not invoice records that exist. Um, because that's another place companies fall short is they don't put in the date far enough back and then it just eliminates things from the report. Um, that we do have occasion when the, for some reason, um, there is an, there is a, uh, I hate to say this, but there's a bug in this version, in version 10.2 anyway that if you are using the same packing slip number with multiple suppliers it doesn't and you delete a receipt it doesn't back out the right receipt correctly even if it's a different supplier so we have to run our capture frequently to make sure that um, we are not tripping into that those are hard to find I, I can't see the question because I've got the stump the chump question thing on my screen, so I can't. Be yeah, more I'm sorry, was, I, I didn't have this in the stump the chump. These just came in recently. Um, oh, I as see. Far okay. as for cleaning that up, I'm going to say it's journal entries to kind of fix them, bring them back to accurate, and then move forward. Yeah, I mean, we we would like enter dummy receipts against what's on the um, against the receive uh, dummy invoices against the receipt that's on the R and I that you want to get rid of, and then write that off to the same account that got hit from the um, the receipt entry. Because what you want, you know, when it did the when it did the original hit to the R and I, it hit the expense or inventory or whatever at that point in time. So you need to make sure that when you clear that, you're backing it out of the right account. But that's all I could think of is journal entering and fixing them back to the right dollar amounts they should be at once you yes. get the cleanup done. Yeah, so if you know what all those, but see, you're going to, you know, what, what's the other side of your journal entry besides the RNI? What expenses are you going to hit? And if the dollars are big enough, you're not going to want to hit them to just, you know, some kind of a wash account. But you know, if it's if it's immaterial dollars, you know, you could, you know, maybe just write them off to cost of sales or something directly to ex to get the, rid of that or to to, to um, back out that expense. And Caitlin, if you can just go ahead and put in chat message there, did that answer your questions of ideas on how to handle this? Yes, that gives her a good start. Awesome. Any other questions for the day? I'm like, we're in that Q&A session, of the stump the chump here. Okay, back to you in the studio there, Fred. 
Okay, uh, just a few last minute things. Thank you everybody who presented and um, thank you to the, all the guests that hung out for Stump the Chump. Uh, reminder, survey will go out, I believe as soon as the meeting ends, otherwise it will also show up tomorrow morning for you. Please fill that out for us. Uh, and again, tomorrow morning, I'll send that email out from uh, uh, Source Day that has the information if you're looking for more information from them, uh, as well as to register for those, uh, uh, I guess I, for lack of a better term, the free dollars that you can donate, as well as receive yourself. I think that's everything, unless any of the, the uh, panelists have anything to add. All right, thank you everybody. Okay. I appreciate y'all helping out with a great presentation for the day. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.